So welcome all um, to the HEAL webinar where Shyam Yu Choudhury is going to speak about his work around uh, conservation research in Bangladesh. Uh, Shyam is a conservation biologist and ornithologist working on protection of a uh, number of globally threatened species in Bangladesh and abroad for the last 10 or 15 years. To us Indians, uh, he is mainly known for his work around spoonbill, sandpiper and shorebirds. Um, he is the assistant coordinator of uh, the spoonbill sandpiper task force. Um, but he also works with a number of other critically endangered and endangered species like the Palaces fish eagle and mast finfoot. Um, he has a Bangladesh raptor research and conservation initiative, which mainly focuses on Palaces fish eagles uh, in northeastern Bangladesh. He has worked with riverine birds of Bangladesh, particularly around um, nesting ecology of river lapwings, and he has proposed two new protected areas in Bangladesh based on his work. So um, his, his accolades and achievements are very long, so it would take a long time to go through all of that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll switch over to him. Uh, just to, uh, one last thing, we are happy to have him here in this webinar and particularly as a member of HEAL and um, as, a, as, a, as a part of the special task force for HEAL. So we are happy and proud to um, you, have him with us. Thanks very much for inviting me to talk about Bird Conservation Initiative in Bangladesh. Uh, before I start, I must warn you that I might get disconnected anytime. And if that happens, I will try and come back within a minute. Uh, but that's it. But I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay, I have you. Will Just have one to... quick thing. You can put your questions in the chat and we will take the questions. Well, I'll curate the questions and post them to Shana at the end of the conversation. Okay, yeah, I'm going to share my screen, but it says host disabled participant sh screen sharing. Oh. Yes. Um, right. Exactly. Well, let me try to see um, how to. Uh, how do I enable that? Make host. All right. I'll, yeah, I'll, there I'll are multiple parts. Host as well. Yeah, so, I, got it. I got it. Okay. Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, um, as you know that I will talk about prioritizing conservation initiatives um, in Bangladesh, especially I'll talk about bird conservation projects, but I mainly work on Spoonbill Sandpiper as Orko that mentioned and as an assistant coordinator of the Spoonbill Sandpiper Task Force. But I was specifically told not to mention Spoonbill Sandpiper today because everyone knows about the bird and they are quite tired of listening about that story. Okay, okay. So I was thinking why we're doing this webinar and I think the take home message for you guys could be, you know, to first of all, to know what we are doing in Bangladesh um, to do uh, for bird conservation. At the same time, how we use evidence to determine our conservation actions and outcome and also why it's important to uh, have an evidence um, for this. I think it might be good if people who are not speaking are on mute. Um, right. So the outline of the talk is basically here. So I will give an introduction um, to birds of Bangladesh and then I'll talk about mask finfoot, uh, our project on mask finfoot and palaces fish eagle. I have crossed out the Spoonbill Sandpiper um, intentionally so that you know that I'm not going to talk about that. Um, so as you know that Bangladesh is, um, is a country with huge population, very similar to India. And that is one of the main reasons why you have so many issues, uh, conservation issues that we need to address. And despite that, even though we have our country is very small, we still have 710 species of birds that were recorded in Bangladesh. Many of these are winter visitors. We don't have an endemic, but we still have a good variety of habitats that support large number of birds, especially globally threatened birds. So we have uh, nine critically endangered species. Many of them are gone, but we still have five, five species uh, that, uh, are, that are important uh, in global context. So 
This slide basically tells you my and my team's approach to look at um, species conservation and how we actually select the species um, and uh, you know the way forward with that. So you can see that in the, the first point is the global status that really um, attracts me towards the species because if the global status is critically endangered, then that means that if we have that species present in our localities, then that means that we have to do something about it. At the same time, we look at national status, um, recent records to know that if we can actually, if the species is actually there and if you can do something about it. And then we also speak to experts uh, to see what they think um, about our ideas. And we, we have to do a lot of background research to actually start with the, with the basic question. So after we do that, we try and identify the problem um, because since the species is threatened, there are obviously problems. In order to identify the problems, we have to go through a rigorous scientific process uh, that will tell us um, what is the problem. And then uh, with, based on that, we find solutions. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how we have achieved that or we tried to achieve that. And the first example is musk pinfoot. You know that the musk pinfoot is a globally endangered species um, and bird life says its uh, global population is less than 1000 individuals, but we think it's probably well less than 500 mature birds left in the world. And uh, as you know that the Sundarbans, the Bangladesh part of the Sundarbans is, is a global hotspot. And it's also found in Myanmar and Cambodia. I'll talk about uh, the global status uh, in the end. So what we did on mass pin food back in 2011 is that we looked at its ecology, its, its habitat preferences, its breeding biology. We also attempted to do a population estimate. Um, uh, at the same time, we try and identify what are the direct and immediate th threats that we can address uh, immediately in order to halt any decline if that is happening. At the same time, we attempted to identify hotspot within the Sundarbans because it's a huge area and we really need to know where to prioritize our yes. efforts. So in 2011, um, we started our initial survey in the Eastern part of the Sundarbans uh, that was based on a previous survey that took place in 2004. And we, we had uh, surveyed 344 um, kilometers of waterways um, in the Eastern side. And we basically looked at um, almost all possibly accessible uh, waterways that is five meter to 500 meters wide. We looked for its nets. nests. Initially it was difficult for us to really understand where to look at. But once we found one or two nests, it was quite easy because they always um, nest on overhanging branches. I'll show that where the nest in a minute. So if you see my mouse, so here is a nesting tree. The nest is somewhere here and we were setting up camera traps in that nest during high tide. So during our initial work in 2011, 13 and 14, we have identified 25 uh, nests of the mask pinfoot. And uh, we found that uh, they prefer gewa, it's, it's a native plant of the Sundarbans and Sundari as well. Um, so these are the two main species that they prefer. At the same time, we spoke to fishermen when we were uh, doing the service. We had encountered a lot of them and we asked them if they know the bird and if, what they think about the bird and if they have um, seen the bird or if any other activities they had in relation to the bird. So we studied the breeding biology with camera traps at the same time uh, direct observation using a floating height. You can see in this first image, um, a boat and a height on, on, um, floating on the boat. So we use that height uh, around 30 kilometers, uh, sorry, 30 meters from the nest um, so that we don't disturb the birds. And we were uh, observing birds from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, for a number of days to see the behavior of, of adult birds uh, at nest. And this is a chick of one day old. So through our camera traps, we, we have um, revealed for the first time the incubation behavior of the mask input. And we've seen that the female is the main uh, participant in incubation and the male was initially participating, um, but then it had left the nest five days before the chick had hatched, which means that the male uh, 
we're actually not really participating towards the end. We're not sure if it's a phenomenon for the one nest or if it's the general pattern. We have actually seen the male um, away from the nest, uh, I think 700 uh, meter away from the nest, feeding somewhere else, but it did not um, stay with the female. So the camera traps uh, showed us, um, uh, gave us many other interesting um, information. Uh, this is a second nest that we had observed and we found that um, there were uh, six eggs and one day uh, we came to check, check the camera trap and we saw that the uh, uh, changeable hawk eagle had taken all the eggs within one hour. So that, was, that nest was destroyed and we had lost a lot of data. We were expecting to get um, a good sample, um, good observation from this nest. So if I zoom out and tell you, uh, give you an, um, an uh, outlook of the overall population and the nesting situation in the Sundarbans, you can see that um, these um, stars are the nests that we found and there, are, um, there is a triangles. Those are the nests that were found in 2004 surveys. Um, and we did a comparison with these 2004 surveys and we saw that there is a progressive shift in change in, in their breeding uh, behavior. So they were primarily building nests on shundra trees back in 2004, but when we did surveys um, seven or eight years later, we saw that they, they are not really preferring shundra anymore. They were, the preferences were more or less distributed um, between two or three other species. So that was quite interesting. And at the same time, uh, if you can see the, uh, the graph, um, the 2004, they were uh, mainly um, constructing nests on much wider creek and the tree, tree diameter was much more thinner. So when we did the survey, our, um, these are the measurements that were very different and we were not really sure why this is happening. But we made a few assumptions. Uh, sorry, this is a very busy slide but I will tell you what is, uh, what is it about. So our guess is that because of uh, the increasing salinity and um, various other sea level rise problems and tropical cyclone as well, uh, the fin mass fin food, they were breeding in the coastal side. Sorry, the map is very, very small. Uh, they were mainly breeding in the south, but we could sort of see a progressive shift towards the north. And our guess is that it could be related to the salinish level because they prefer freshwater zone within the Sundarbans. But we don't really have enough data to prove that. But this is something that, uh, that we, we are really um, worried about. And if, 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 it is, if there are other factors like the breeding uh, success and um, many other uh, uh, breeding related information, we actually don't have that data. If we had that data, then we would have uh, had a better idea. Uh, but um, so the conclusion is that the, we think that the climate change and sea level rise probably, um, uh, you know, changing musk fin foot habitat preference and they are uh, living in a habitat that probably barely, um, you know, fulfills their criteria and they are shifting towards freshwater zones um, with trees uh, that are much more um, um, wider. So another important component of our project was population estimate, which was quite quite difficult to do because you know it's a huge area and um, it, it's not always possible to cover all possible way um, creeks where they could nest. But we had, when we were doing the surveys, we, we have seen that they actually prefer um, creeks that are um, you know, between five and 25 meters wide. So that really helped us to narrow down our search area. And with that data, we had actually worked out a formula to figure out how many nests are there. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but the, the conclusion is that we think that there are approximately 80 breeding pairs left in, in the Eastern part of the Sundarbans. So what we did with that data, is that we also looked at, um, during the service, we also did um, interviews um, targeting local fishermen. 
and many of them have claimed that they have captured finfoot from when they're uh, nesting, especially during the breeding season. So what happened is that when uh, the local fishermen do this kind of fishing, it's called chorpata fishing, where you basically put um, uh, fishing nets along narrow creeks. Um, and um, during the high tide and low tide, they come back and take the fish that is um, captured um, on the land side of the, of the uh, net. So what happens is that when the fishermen go into these narrow creeks to set up their nets, they discover the finfoot nests. During the daytime, the finfoot escapes and they cannot catch it. So what, what they do is they come back at night with a, use a flashlight to sort of um, temporarily blind the finfoot um, and then take the adult bird at the same time eggs. So many of the um, fishermen that I had interviewed had claimed that they have done that in the past. So that was a significant threat that need, needed addressing. Um, and then what we did with this, all of this information is that we, we sort of looked at the global aspect uh, and what is, you know, we looked at it um, in a global context and we had uh, collaborated with, uh, with uh, many other experts in, in Southeast Asia. And we just um, wrote a paper uh, which was accepted in Forktail, uh, which indicates that musk infant is much more threatened than we think. And the global population is probably much less than 500 and it's between 108 um, and uh, 302 individuals, which is, uh, was a big, surprise for all of us to when we worked out these numbers. So you can see in the map that the Bangladesh is definitely uh, one of the main hotspots and Cambodia as well is one of the important countries. The sad news is we thought Myanmar would be um, a significant country like Cambodia but when we looked at the data it, it told us it's not really um, uh, an important country anymore. There are uh, there might, might be finfoots um, in Myanmar, but the population would be very, very small. And if you look at the graph to the left um, at the bottom, um, it, it basically tells you um, the mass finfoot sightings um, in Southeast Asia, which also shows a declining trend. The only increase in, in Cambodia is basically because there are more surveys in the areas of the bird occur. So what happens is, is that, um, I'm gonna come back to that. So the reason we, we worked on this paper is to really um, um, you know, show the international community that the pinfoot is declining and is more threatened um, than we think. And uh, it will probably lead us, uh, lead the, um, uplist the species to critical endangered, which is sad, but it is needed um, you know, um, urgently, because then um, if the species become critically endangered, endangered then the, the government and other NGOs will immediately, um, you know, start working on the, this and will try and solve the problems that it's currently facing, including Bangladesh government. So once it becomes critically endangered, I'm pretty sure the forest department will take mass input much more seriously. So that was our way to, um, you know, go you know to to um sort of expand our work in a global context and collaborate with others to to really solve the problem with this species i don't really know if we can solve the problem if the climate change issues were actually real but we need to do some more work to understand what's going on with that so our plan is to do um, uh, a bit more detailed uh, study on the biology of the mask and food, um, also habitat preference and try and see what is the actually, uh, what's the relationship with the, with salinity and sulfur intrusion and all of that. And we also need to set up a population monitoring uh, protocol. That is, this is really important because that, that's also evidence-based because if you don't know the population and if you, if you don't know if the bird is declining or increasing, you will never be able to work out if your conservation interventions is actually working or not. Um, at the same time, we want to see, uh, we want to set up um, a long-term monitoring protocol, not only in the Sundarbans, but um, uh, globally. And another very interesting thing that we have discovered during our work in the Sundarbans is that the mass fin food um, every individual have a very distinct facial pattern, um, like the tigers, they have the different stripes, but finfoot have different facial pattern. You can see in this image that the white hair is much thicker than the white hair. So this is uh, one of my ideas to 
um, to do a market capture survey in the Sundarbans uh, to standardize our population estimates. Um, and that will tell us uh, much more uh, precise, um, that will give us a better estimate. Right, so this is a video that I wanted to share. And I recorded this during uh, my work from the hive. It's a female, it's going to its nest. Right. So I'm going to talk about Palasis fish eagle now. Orkuda, do you think it's we can take some questions on FinFood or we want to continue and take the questions later? I guess I guess we can uh, take the questions on FinFood since we are on the topic. So yeah, would be great. I don't know whether you looked at the chat. I think the first question was that, uh, why do you think that uh, all the nests are on the Eastern part of Sundarbans and um, are there nests on the western part of Sundarbans or do, do we not know about it because it wasn't surveyed? Is there any correlation between salinity and mast fin food nests, um, which I, mast fin foods are also found in uh, fresh water, so I don't suppose, uh, yeah. but you, you'll be the best to answer that. Yeah. So the western part, we didn't survey that for the specific um, uh, Finfoot project, but we know from other data, we have visited that site uh, many times, um, us and other bird watchers and scientists, and there was no record in the western part of the Shundubans, and that's why we decided to focus on the eastern part. Um, and there is a relationship with salinity, of course, and even though I talked about the eastern side, so eastern side, the Sundarbans gets a lot of fresh water from the upstream. There are two major rivers in that area and gets, that gets huge amount of fresh water. So basically the eastern side is, although it's, it's coastal, but it is not as saline as the western part. So our suspicion was that um, because of the various um, um, issues related to climate change, sea level rise and you know, lack of fresh water from the upstream and all of that, the habitat in the Eastern side, especially in the coast had changed. Um, as I, and as I explained that we don't really have uh, exact uh, data on the salinity and the relationship of the mass of input. When we, after we did the surveys and we looked at the data, we speculated that these are the um, possibility that could lead the population uh, ship, uh, towards the north. And there are also a couple of big cyclones um, and that, that could have also played a role to wipe out the population in the south, in the coast. So I think it's it's a very very um, um, tricky subject, and it needs more work, uh, especially if you want to establish a relationship between mass food and climate change slash sea level rise. Right. Um, another question was that: um, Is there any um, hunting pressure on mass inputs in Bangladesh and uh, in other countries as well? For example, is there hunting in Cambodia? So the another main country is Cambodia. The population in Cambodia is, is actually very, very slim. Um, and the locals did um, capture them, um, but the, uh, there are a couple of NGOs who are working uh, at, the, at the area now. So they, they sort of um, uh, um, initiated an, uh, a conservation initiative that involves people not um, disturbing the nests. And if, even if they see fin food or encounter a nest, they will not bother them, but it is a problem. Human disturbance is a problem. And in Bangladesh, um, uh, especially the chartwater fishermen, uh, they have uh, definitely have uh, tasted musk input. Um, and um, uh, so the forest department actually did an excellent job um, two years ago uh, when they had, um, so, you know, in some of the, some of the creeks, they had, creeks they had not given permission uh, for the local fishermen, especially during the breeding season to enter. Um, but our um, main um, goal here is to really match those uh, with our findings so that uh, those overlap with the mass food hotspots. 
um, you know, this, this ban, but we're also mindful of the fact that we cannot uh, really take away um, the access from the local community, but, but because they need them. And therefore we think that if we could figure out some creeks that's really important for Finfoot um, uh, in, in the breeding season and also in winter, uh, that would be really useful. Right, okay. And the last question around that was that, is it hard uh, with the population size so small, is captive breeding really a possibility? Has it ever been tried with mass conflicts? Well, captive breeding is, uh, conservation breeding is another thing. So before we initiate conservation breeding, we really have to um, look at what are the problems. And you know, only after we solve those problems, we could probably, should probably go into conservation breeding. Um, right now, um, the major issues that we see is uh, human disturbance, uh, and that could be solved, um, in fact, quite easily in the in the Bangladesh on the one's part, because uh, the government has uh, full control over that. Um, but in long run, uh, if we if the problems that we are suspecting, such as climate change and sea level rise, if those are uh, playing a role here, then um, captive breeding may not be able to, uh, you know. Uh, put a stop of this population decline. Um, maybe it could be a, a good uh, solution for other countries if we can provide um, habitat protection, first of all. So we have to ensure habitat protection, protection and then um, after that, we can get into other initiatives like conservation breeding. And is this entire mass finfoot habitat in Bangladesh uh, within protected areas? Yeah, yeah. But the, the thing is, even though these are protected, people get access, uh, and that, that is where the problem takes place. People, tourists, there are lots of tourists that go uh, in the wintering season. Um, thankfully, there are not many tourists going in the breeding season. And uh, in some of the creeks uh, the, where the masculine food feed um, is actually, um, uh, you know, places where tourists go, and there is a lot of disturbance and, um, you know, a lot, a lot of boats going into the creeks. And so thus the other question was that, is there any attempt to create awareness amongst uh, the tourists or the locals about um, the bird being critically endangered? Exactly, so that, that was one of the things that I, I probably didn't mention that uh, one of the uh, outcomes of our project is raising the profile of the bird. We did that through various publications, uh, scientific papers, as well as many uh, newspaper articles and websites and things like that. So if we raise the profile, then people will know about it. We have also actually did uh, campaigns in, in local schools in, in one of the areas from where the fishermen were coming. Um, I should have included that slide. Um, so that is another thing that we really have to do. But first of all, we have to convince the government um, that this is a, an important species. It is no less important than the tigers and they really have to take it more seriously. And I think we have, we have, we're almost there. We have, we will achieve that um, once uh, some of our publications come out. All right, great. I think that's, that's, uh, that concludes the mask section. That's all the, that's all the questions that we had. You can move ahead, Sean. Right, thank you. Right, so Pelasus fish eagle. I think many of you have seen that uh, because it's not as rare as the musk finfoot, uh, but it is also globally endangered. Um, and it actually, we got to know about um, uh, uh, some very interesting information about the Pelasus fish eagle a couple of years ago when um, an American scientist a satellite tag three Pelasus fish eagle, um, I think two in India and one in uh, Mongolia to see their uh, migration. So what came out through that study is that there is actually one single subpopulation of the Palasa fish eagle. Previously, we thought that there is a, there are different subpopulation in the Indian subcontinent and in, in, in Central Asia, in Mongolia. But with that study, we know that the Palasa fish eagle is actually, there is actually one subpopulation that is a migratory subpopulation that breeds in our region. And um, in summer, they migrate to the north, uh, especially Mongolia. So with that information, uh, the Palasa fish eagle was uh, listed to in, uh, endangered um, um, in 2017. And that's when it caught my attention. Uh, I, uh, I was very curious to see why the, it 
suddenly became endangered. And when I read, read about it, and I thought, okay, we should definitely do something about it uh, in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, with that idea, uh, in 2007, we started um, to look at uh, literature uh, to see where the plus physical nests are. We already knew that there, the nest in the northeastern, you can see this area, northeastern Howard Basin, we call it, it's freshwater, seasonal freshwater wetlands, basically shallow lands um, um, that is completely submerged in summer. And um, in winter, you have pockets of lakes um, and freshwater uh, area where you get plenty of fish and that attracts the fish eagles. <coughs> So in 2007, uh, we, we, we got a, a small grant from, from the Oriental Bird Club when we started um, doing, uh, started visiting the site um, to see um, what would be the best method to do this, um, to approach this question. Um, first of all, we needed to identify, we wanted to identify all the nests um, in Northeast Bangladesh and what is, um, what's the habitat they prefer, and if possible, study a bit of the breeding biology and obviously estimate population. And most importantly, identify key threats and immediate threats that we can mitigate. So with that idea, we went to the field, we spoke to the local people in Northeast Bangladesh um, to see um, if they know about the Palasas fish eagle and if they know anything about the ecology of the bird, where they come to Bangladesh and things like that. So um, I'm sorry, this looks a bit complicated, but I'll try and explain what it is. So in order to identify, in order to actually figure out um, a suitable survey method, um, because it's a huge area and uh, it was not possible to basically check every tree to, um, to look for the Palacios fish eagle. So we did a sort of a pilot study um, in, this, um, in this map uh, B uh, to the right, you can see that there is, there is a circle and there are white dots and black dots and there are red triangles, I'll tell you in, in a minute. So when we were talking about um, the Palacios fish eagle, it seemed like the local people knew about it. Um, and there was a very strong cultural relationship between the locals and the Palacios fish eagle. And there is actually a special puja that happens uh, when the Palacios fish eagle arrive in every, um, every uh, winter. So um, when we were doing this initial survey, we we figured that, okay, locals, um, they, they are very, very knowledgeable about the species. And then we started to take uh, more intense um, interviews. And we figured that uh, most people know about one nest within one kilometer, and that is this map is about. So the white dots are people who knew about the nest and the black dots are people who didn't know about the nest. Um, so basically we worked out the proportion of the known and unknown people, uh, of, of course, on the nest. And then we uh, figured out a, a, radi um, a radius within which almost everyone knew about the Palaces fish eagle. And that was three kilometers. And then we worked out three, um, three by three kilometer um, uh, grids uh, within the entire study area. And we took at least two interviews within each grid and that was 955 interviews. And it took us almost three years to, uh, to complete the study. So that um, gave us a, a very complete understanding of what's going on in Northeast Bangladesh with Palaces Fish Eagle. And we found 53 nests. Um, all right. Um, we found 53 nests um, and um, we actually um, found correlation with, with the habitat features. And we identified key threats. Um, so one of the main problems that the Palaces fish eagle face is that um, when during the pre-monsoon season, when there is a storm, the, uh, the chicks, they fall from the nest and they die. Uh, basically, this just simply they cannot survive. Um, so that was one key problem that we have identified. We have also seen some sort of conflict with local people. Um, when some Palaces fish eagle take um, chick or a duckling um, from a household, then they, some of them, they don't like it. Um, and um, people cut the nesting tree because usually it's the biggest uh, tree in the area and, and then the Palaces fish eagle do not return. 
But at the same time, uh, we found that there are uh, many people who are who actually love this bird and they want them to return and they don't want to cut the tree. There are lots of people like that. So we um, we sort of uh, started, um, I, I, don't, I didn't include that in the slide, um, a nest garden initiative, which will involve um, at least one guardian for each nest. Um, and we have already have many volunteers who are interested to uh, participate in that. And then there are also um, others who are a bit problematic, as you know, um, happens in all, all the cases. Uh, we are working with them. So if I, um give you a graphical abstract of what is happening um if you can you can see that um the Pelasis fish eagle they're very used to people they they are always uh, nesting uh, within uh within within the um harbor basin where we have um, people you know doing their everyday activities agriculture um and basically, they don't really need intact freshwater wetland uh, in order to produce offspring, which is great. But um, the the problem is that if if the chick fall um, during the um, uh, you know, pre monsoon storm, and then the, if the people cut the nesting trees, then that is an immediate threat that we need to address. Um, the other uh, issues that we should approach in the future. Um, to gather more evidence is that how um, sort of what they're eating and um, how um, by comparing between nests uh, of um, nests that are located in a, in a healthy wetland and nests that are located in sort of a, near the city when the wetlands are not so great. If you compare that we can work out what are the um, ideal habitat features for, for Palacios Fisical and then we can probably work out a way to um, uh, to make the habitats more suitable for them. But first of all, we, we really have to secure all 53 nests uh, that we have identified. And many of these nests are actually on uh, communication towers. Um, so that is one thing. So those will not be cut off. Um, but we, we were looking at um, uh, talking to uh, cell phone companies to see if, um, if they could leave those nests undisturbed. So it's a really, uh, it is going to be a long-term initiative and I think we will achieve uh, um, uh, really important conservation outcomes through this um, and we have a future plan for that. Um, so that's all about Palaces Fish Eagle. Um, it was really exciting to work in Northeast Bangladesh, especially with um, communicating with so many locals and, um, and you know, understanding their relationship with this eagle. There are many people who actually shared, um, I'm mindful of the time, um, shared, uh, you know, their personal relationship with the Palaces Fish Eagle. One of the elders told us that uh, they used to get up in the morning uh, for morning prayer uh, by listening to the Palaces Fish Eagle calls when there was no clock or anything. Um, so there are people who really um, value and love this bird, um, while there are others who are not so happy about it, and we have to work with them. So uh, this- uh, A couple uh, of quick questions, Sham. One is, okay. from, one is from Tiasha, who, who, who asks, uh, um, what is the motivation um, behind people becoming um, nest guardians? Uh, do they get any incentives and uh, how do we ensure their long-term involvement? Right. So um, that is something that we are working on, but we have worked with a few people and they all have volunteered. Um, um, volunteered as in a way that um, the bird is not really uh, a problem for them. Uh, they're not uh, doing any harm for them and they're quite, quite proud of the fact that the bird is there. And uh, but not everyone is obviously um, like that. So we're still working out a way to sort of um, give them kind of a benefit um, to, uh, so that they don't cut the nest. And all nests are not actually um, located in households. There are other nests that are on government properties and we have to find people to, to deal with that. But I understand the fact that uh, people will have to see some kind of benefit, benefit um, so that they, they remain engaged. Um, one of the problems that we have seen, um, so this, 
so the in conservation interventions before we do that it should do a bit more work and i normally i i actually take quite some time to um to start any work that is not research um especially conservation interventions to really understand locals their motives i'll give you an example of what happened with palaces fishigal so there was um there was a, in one of the nests there was a there was a guy from from dhaka who went there and the locals said that he's going to cut the nest uh, nesting tree and the guy paid him cash um and after that he sort of thought that anyone coming from outside is going to give us cash to keep the uh, nesting tree and that was a very wrong move because the guy got motivated in a very different way um and um uh, he spoke to few other people and in that area they know that you know uh, in order to keep the polasis fishigal nesting tree they will get um they will get cash um so that was something that we are well aware of and we want we don't want to Uh, start anything that is not sustainable and we are working to see how we can do that one of the ways that i th i think that works well in in these situations since there are no major conflict in between our interested species and the locals is that you know uh, highlighting the individuals in local newspapers or you know in tv media and other things um so that they feel a part of uh, the initiative and they know that they're doing something that is important and recognized um by doing that you can actually make them um involved and invested for a long term without uh giving them any direct benefit and uh, how far is the bangladesh forest uh, department involved in this conservation initiative and this one not yet but um, i think they are going to be uh, involved uh, quite um, intensively um, because so far it was mainly uh, the research part that we invested on um, and now we have identified this main uh, main uh, areas that we need to focus and the problems that that can be solved so that is something that we are going to work on in a couple of years to really uh, work with the forest department and not only that other interested um other local government um uh, parties who have um you know work with you know land ministry and all of that so those people will need to be involved um for long term conservation um so one of the um, problems that we see with uh, crater adjacent nests in northeast india is could be similar to that of palaces fish eagle we have uh, a l um, very high percentage of chick mortality because of falling from the nest to the ground and greater adjacent nests on very tall trees the tallest trees around yeah. that's what they choose to nest on so what they did in a couple of locations uh, is to put uh, nets below the trees which catches the chicks and then they have a mechanism to put the chick back up on the nest yeah do you think something like that might work or it's too far yeah so I actually didn't in include any of the conservation initiatives yet because we I have not worked it out well, so um, it's too early. But we did why we as a pilot study. We just last month we um, we did a workshop with the locals uh, on sort of uh, chick handling and chick rehabilitation. Uh, we distributed a small pamphlet to um, to really explain to them how they can. um uh deal with with the problem when when the chick uh, fall from the nest uh, and uh, sort of initial um you know what they should do when that happens uh, you know where should keep where should uh, they keep the chick and what what would be the food for a few days and we have given um, a cell phone number so that they can contact us immediately if that happens but it is not really uh it doesn't happen for all nests um but it happens maybe say for you know I, i'm not this is not an exact day i'll just just my guess to make is that maybe you know 10 chicks uh, for 50 nets that is still quite huge um so that that's something we have to work on and i think that that's a good idea that we could do if if that happens um more than we think it does then um you know the net on on the ground would be would be a sensible approach um one other question was that is there any religious significance or tradition attached to palaces fish eagle and in particular you mentioned a certain ritual a puja does that correspond to palaces fish eagle itself or it just the timing 
I think it 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 has something to do with Pallas's fish eagle. So the timing is that it's uh, so we, when the Pallas's fish eagle arrives in the area, it's October, and that's the time when we do the uh, when uh, when they get more uh, um, uh, uh, solid land because that area is completely submerged in in summer, and when the winter starts, they start to get um, uh, lands um, and you know less areas inundated and when they plant um, when they start agriculture um, so basically the connection is that when the palaces fish eagle come and they call and it's time to do um, the cultivation and that's where the connection uh, with the repo and, and that's sort of disappearing as uh, in, in last in a couple of interviews that we have taken um, last season people said that they are no longer um, you know they you know participate in that and something we should probably try and reestablish. Okay. All right. Um, that's that's all the questions that I had about Palaces Fish Eagle. I see that you said that uh, I will talk about these another day about the other projects that you have, but it would be nice if you can briefly touch upon them. We still have a little bit of time left. Right. In this context, uh, you know, Shamiran Sh Chha also says, uh, Hi, Shyam, please share your findings on the bird life of River and Islands, chores of uh, for the Ganges of Rajshahi yeah. and Champai Nawab yeah. Ganj. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. If you can briefly uh, touch uh, on those. Very brief about yeah. it. I see another question. Is it possible to plant trees in protected areas? Um, yeah, so these are the long term interventions that we should, should be looking at. We have seen that the Palasis fish eagle prefers a certain kind of tree, a bombax sites, a silk cotton tree, which is not only important for Palasis fish eagle, but Many other species, adjutants as well, uh, Indian spotted eagle as well. So that tree. So the the uh, we could what we could do is that we could try and plant these trees in agricultural land, um, and then. But that's like a very long term solution. Um, but we have to start that um, uh, right now, you know, to um, to provide habitat in maybe ten years down the line, um, and uh, I think. One of the other things that we have noticed is that they build nests in areas such as graveyard or, you know, sanitary, you know, other religiously important places where they get less disturbance. So that's that's a very um, interesting thing to notice. And if that happens, if, because the graveyard in those areas have uh, tall trees and people don't cut those. Um, so they get some kind of benefit of the lab landscape and local culture itself um but obviously yes planting tree would be would be a good long-term investment right so riverine birds uh just one quick question on yeah. that what, what reminds me is that are there uh, instances of uh, fish eagles nesting on electric pylons or pillars or such artificial yeah. i ask this because uh, we have very old records of palaces fish eagle from east kolkata wetlands and we don't have such tall trees here what they, yeah, used to, yeah. they, they, they used to nest with those electric poles. All of them are nesting records from electric poles. Yeah, yes, definitely. So what we call is that the communication tower, it's quite, it's slightly different than the electric posts. The communication tower, cell phone company towers now is, is actually quite suitable for uh, raptor nesting because they have um, a base. Um, there are two bases, one at the, at the top and one at the, uh, in the middle. So I have seen many of many birds that is uh, actually nesting in these uh, platforms. Um, Uli next stork as well. So that's that's really interesting um, thing that is happening. And we have found uh, minimum six nests nests of the Pallas's fish eagle on communication towers. And uh, as I was indicating, that we will uh, look at how we can work with with the cell phone companies to see how we can um, leave the nest undisturbed. Okay. Great. Right. So um, river iron birds uh, back in uh, 2010 and 11, um, when uh, the uh, black billed tern was um, declared endangered, that obviously captured my attention. And I wanted to look at uh, what is happening with the black billed tern in Bangladesh. And I uh, did a thorough survey in, in Potda and Jomuna River Basin. Uh, basically, I took a boat from one part of the Potda and then went up far up north uh, near uh, 
Chilmary to try and find black belly turn. Unfortunately, we didn't find any black belly turn during that two year survey. Um, but then the black belly turn was discovered a couple of years later in Chapai Nobab Gonj um, during a, a Goryeo survey. Um, and there was only a few nests, um, but uh, we didn't really find um, any nest in last two, three seasons. Um, but it's difficult to confirm that because we didn't really do a proper survey. It's just basically local birders. And I also visited that site and went and looked for the um, nests and um, black village and they didn't find it. Um, we also have a long-term monitoring scheme of the river, river lapwing, um, sort of published one paper on that, and uh, we want to continue the monitoring in Chapai Nawab Gonj, especially river, river lapwing. We have high density of river lapwings in that area. And um, that area in Chapai Nawab Gonj, we actually had uh, uh, nesting Indian skimmers. Uh, there were two nests of Indian skimmers. They're nesting black bullet turd. Uh, nesting river turn, but all those records are basically one season. Uh, I and others uh, when they're the following true breeding seasons, but we didn't find it. It's it's very very close to the Indian border, so you know it's uh, it might be just they have probably shifted a bit, little bit um, into the border and breeding somewhere nearby. Uh, and there are no recent uh, in last two seasons there are no records of black uh, black belly turn. Um, not, not even in winter in that area. Um, and uh, the main, um, one of the key things that we did in under the river and bird initiative was uh, to look at um, bristle grass bird. And in order to do that, we actually um, surveyed many of the um, shore islands, shore is basically um, islands in river and systems um, with grasslands. Um, we initially uh, did um, a couple of surveys to uh, get the location of the birds, and then we did remote sensing to um, identify the areas where we should look at um, along Paddan Magna, uh, Paddan Jomuna River Basin. And we actually found uh, bristle grass, but in every single spot, uh, every single grassland in, along these rivers. Um, and we just finished writing up the paper and we'll publish it. And it says that the bristle grass bird is actually much less threatened um, than we think. And the population is widely distributed throughout the uh, river and ecosystems of Bangladesh. We didn't know about this simply because uh, we didn't visit those sites in March and April when they breed and when they call. So with the new technology and, you know, call recording equipments and cameras and everything which uh, you know we we can now identify the birds uh, quite easily but historically those things were not available and people were birding in in, in specific seasons and only few people were birding but now we have so many eyes and the citizen signs and e-birds everything is flourishing so we get a lot more data and um so bristle grassbird is one of those birds that is thankfully is not yet um, as uh, in, in a dire condition as other species we talked about today. Um, but th that doesn't mean that we, we don't need to do anything about them. We really have to protect some of the grassland areas uh, along our um, river Rhine ecosystems uh, to keep the population intact. And as Arkoda was mentioned, mentioning that we had proposed a few uh, river Rhine protected areas um, and um, we're constantly in, in touch with the forest department uh, to get those designated, uh, but we haven't had luck yet, hopefully in future. Another, pro another um, project that uh, me and my team work on is on uh, fishing cat. Um, I'm sure Tiasa is all years now, but she knows all about the project. And um, that is also in, in a freshwater wetland in Northeast, where we also have Palacis fishicles, so the habitats overlap. Um, and I think one of the things that um, I would like to mention is that uh, you have seen that most of my initiatives are basically wetland based. Um, and mo most of these are freshwater wetlands, but my major work is on coastal wetlands. I focus on wetlands for a specific reason. And um, if you remember, my first slide is that um, when I approach a project, I assess um, what is achievable and what is realistic. 
and I, I, I think uh, my understanding is that it is, um, it is much more, uh, well, I would say less complex um, to achieve conservation outcomes in terms of wetlands uh, rather than other habitats such as forests, um, uh, because um, it's much more complex, complicated to protect forests because it's, it's tree and, uh, you know, people it's basically money for uh, for the local communities, and it's really really complicated to halt that. Um, but for wetland, it's fairly straightforward. We just have to leave the uh, the habitat as it is now. Uh, the people will go for fishing um, and other things, but that is not a big uh, big threat uh, for many wildlife, and not changing the habitat drastically. Right, and uh, it's when I mentioned all this work, it's basically not my work, it's it's teamwork and there's a lot of people who support our work and uh, I just had space to accommodate a few of them. Um, and uh, yeah, so there are plenty of other people who help us with various things um, as well. And most importantly, people who give us money to do this work. Um, I Sorry, I couldn't help myself to add a Swindles and Piper illustration, so I did that. Um, Right, so these are the people, uh, organizations who supported us um, in um, in last 12 years um, in, in various projects. So I'm very, very grateful to all of them. And you can see more about our work if you scan that QR code. I figured it out today how to do it. Because I've seen people doing it, I didn't know how to do it, it was annoying. But anyway, so you can go to that website. So ORCID is basically a professional, um, a, a, sort of an online, uh, CV, where you can add all your recent papers and grants and activities and things like that. And at the bottom, you have my Twitter handler, which is more professional than Facebook, I think. Right. So that's about it. Uh, Sham, um, before we let you go, uh, a couple of very quick questions from me. What are the uh, uh, conservation challenges um, that you see um, in the Riverine Islands or, um, you know, the grassland alongside river in Bangladesh and in particular in uh, central Bengal where we have possibly similar habitat, we see pesticide runoff to be a main problem where cultivation does take place. Do you see similar problems as well? Yeah, well, talking about the problems, I think not only in case of freshwater wetlands, also in case of coastal wetlands. I think the main problems is uh, that we are facing and we're going to face each large scale development. Um, and that is something uh, that is coming uh, in our way, especially in case of Bangladesh, and especially in case of coastal wetlands, in, in, it is going to be a big problem in the next couple of years. And therefore we really need to um, uh, identify the important sites and get those protected as soon as we can. Um, and, you know, you might, many people, especially people in Bangladesh would tell me that, you know, you have many protected areas, but what did, what did those achieve? But I think the protected area approach is, is, the, is the right approach simply because those are, uh, those act as a, as a barrier of many development projects. Um, because the development project, they need funding and they go to big funding organizations. And when the, the organizations who are going to give the funds see that this is a protected area and they simply, uh, in many cases, they back out. And basically, uh, protected area status uh, work as a huge barrier for these development projects. Obviously, we know all our, you know, we know that our government can do basically anything that they want. But uh, my point is that that the, the protected area status really works as a barrier. Regarding pesticide, I think it is uh, it is definitely a problem, uh, and is definitely playing a key you know it's a key issue in our food chain. But I don't really have enough data in in this area to really comment on that. But one of the things that I would tell you is that um, we we uh, monitored one of the Palasis fish eagle nests, and we saw that there are plenty of rodents that the Palasis fish eagle were eating which is good and bad in two ways. Good that we can take that information to the locals and tell them that this, is, this bird is actually helping you 
uh, you know, uh, by by taking taking rodents and rats from your ecosystems, uh, bad in a way that that could um, the rats could accumulate uh, you know accumulate um, a lot of um, uh, things through pesticides and things like that. So that could be uh, an issue that I think that needs uh, this question needs a broad scientific approach to address, uh, which is sort of beyond uh, the capacity uh, or the um, objectives of our project, because we, we sort of uh, look at the things that that we that we can achieve immediately and can take conservation action very, very, very quickly. But I uh, definitely acknowledge the fact that all of these projects should be long term and it should look at things um, like the agricultural runoff and pesticide usage. Thanks. Thank you, Sham, for this very interesting and insightful presentation. Thank it was you. great to have you with us. And we surely keep on taking interest in your work in Bangladesh. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye.